So we are starting a fall sermon series today on Paul's, the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches in Philippi. Um, we called them the churches in Philippi because they were house churches. They met in various people's homes, and so he wrote to them. And um, when I was, uh, yesterday I was here at the church, our deacons, our deacons were ordained as servants here in the church. We have 12 wonderful deacons, very dedicated, and we were doing a training, and partway through when all the, fortunately this happened at a point when the deacons were like discussing something amongst themselves, my phone rings, it's my mom. And I don't usually, I don't often have Saturday morning meetings, so she didn't realize I was in the middle of something, and lots going on in the family, so I pick up the phone, and well, she was calling because she'd been digging around in the back of her underwear drawer, where that's not as weird as it sounds. She's getting ready to sell her house and sorting through a lot of things, okay? So she was digging around, and for some reason, way back there, she'd hidden, she'd entrusted, I don't know, a letter from me that I must have written when I was like in, in college. And, and she was so excited. She loved this letter. She wanted to read it to me. And, but it started out with these really angsty lines that you write when you're 19 years old trying to get your mom to understand your point of view. And I remember thinking to myself as I listened to her yesterday, whoa, you got to watch what you put in the letter. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Letters have staying power, and uh, so it's good that it blessed her. It just reminded me of who I was at, at, at 19, and I'm, I'm, I liked who I was at 19. I like myself better at 57, so yes, that is my age. Um, and I thought about that in terms of Philippians. Philippians is a letter. There's a number of letters in the New Testament. They were written by leaders in the first century church in this new gospel movement. They have staying power because the people who received them uh, recognized that in them there wasn't simply good human wisdom. There, this was messages from God to God's people for how to live out this gospel for generations to come. They did not hide them in their underwear drawers. They passed them around among the, the new churches. And Philippians is one of those letters. When I was reflecting through uh, preaching this fall, I thought, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's challenging going in the fall. It's challenging going into the fall because, you know, you hit life at a fast pace. It's challenging because of the many things that happen in life anyway, the places of loss or violence or unexpected changes. And then on top of that, we're in an election year, and that raises the, the water level of challenge. It seems like the last election year, and this one as well, it's going to do that for the church in America. We're pretty divided. And a lot of people have a lot of things to say about Christians in the political sphere. Uh, you come to church between September and November in a political year, and it's like, what did she mean by that? What is she saying about that? I mean, just, it's, it's true. And I was holding all that this summer. Honestly, I wanted to do a sermon series called Not My Culture, Not My War, but um, <laughs> uh, on the culture wars in the church. But my, the instruction team uh, kind of said that might not be very inviting. So um, <laughs> you might not show up to church, and I want you to make a habit of being in worship this summer. But Philippians is one of those letters that was written in a time of... Uh, both uh, exciting growth and new possibilities, and also threats to unity. Uh, written in a time, Philippi is a city that is very, very proud of its Roman identity. So these are these Christians in this new church movement that's, that's growing up underneath and trying to figure out their relationship to the state. Uh, and it's a letter full of joy. And as I thought about all the different ways, I don't know how Christians get described in your life or your circles, we're going to hear Christians described a lot of different ways all fall. They may be described as, as, as being ardent and admirable. Christians may be described as being, you know, passionate but misdirected, dangerous. There's a lot of different ways, characteristics. They get attached to followers of Jesus Christ around us. I don't know that joy is the defining characteristic that our neighbors and people in our cities and our, in our world attach to believers, which is a tragedy because joy is the defining characteristic of a people who know they are saved. Joy is the defining characteristic of a people who are certain of a God who saves them. So my hope this fall as we study this letter is that we will reclaim joy, the joy that is given to us 
in the person of Jesus Christ. And we're going to start that by looking just at the very beginning of Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. So let me uh, read this for us. The, you're going to hear two names, Paul and Timothy. We'll hear more about Timothy as we go along. Paul, uh, whose given name, a given Jewish name was Saul. It was a, the premier evangelist in the Mediterranean um, at this time among non-Jews. And he founded the church in Philippi, and he's writing now to that church from prison. He's in prison right now. Here's what he gushes. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray for joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or actively defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection, the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, prayer is a, clearly a theme in these opening sentences in this letter to the Philippians. Paul, uh, uh, almost always, there's only one letter where Paul doesn't open it with thanksgiving, with prayers of thanksgiving for people in a certain place. But of all the letters Paul wrote, this one is really affectionate. This one is really over the top friendly. This is one is really over the top excited about, um, about these folks. And Paul mentions two different types of prayer. So you see in verses three to four, he talks about praying with thanksgiving and joy, that every memory of you, that's him, whenever he remembers them in prayer, he gives thanks for them. And for everything he's praying, for all of them, every one of those petitions, every one of those requests before God is made with joy. So thanksgiving and joy are what typify Paul's prayer for the Philippians. This is something that Paul taught people when it comes to prayer in all of his cities. He went to a city called Thessalonica after Philippi. And in a letter he wrote to the Thessalonians, he says just in short staccato sentences, you know, rejoice always, pray unceasingly, give thanks in all circumstances. So rejoicing, thanksgiving, praying in all circumstances. This, this is central to the way that we reclaim joy. So Paul starts with this. Now in the original language, this description of the characteristic of how he's praying and then why he prays that way. He talks in here, you'll see about partnership in the gospel, about being confident that the one who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He says it's completely right, it's completely justified for him to feel this way about all the Philippians because he knows that they hold him as dear in their hearts as he holds them. And, and, so, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if he's in prison, which is very shameful, or if he's out on the road defending and, and, um, and confirming the gospel, they always share grace with him. That is one sentence in the original uh, letter. In fact, I think actually, look on your, do you have your devices open? When Paul says, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus, what verse number is that? Does anybody see it? Eight, eight. yeah, that's part of the sentence too. So that's all one sentence, okay, from three to eight. Just one long sentence. He is so exuberant. And all of that describes 
the prayers with thanksgiving and joy and why he does that. We're going to unpack that. And then he's got a second mention of prayer, and it's what he's praying for. So three to eight lets us know how he's praying and why. And then nine to 11 tells us the content of his prayers, the, the petitions he's making, and also why he's doing that. He's praying that their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. He wants them to be able to discern what is best so that they can be pure and blameless on the day of Christ Jesus. This day of Christ Jesus in the early church, and in our belief as well, is the reference to the day when Jesus returns as king of the earth and sets all things right, puts all things back in place, uh, finishes the good work that God has begun. And that's, that's the time frame that Paul is praying into. So th there's your orientation of these verses. There's a lot packed into these verses. I wanted to orient us on it. And then I want to unpack these prayers because here's the point today. In order to reclaim joy, to reclaim joy, it starts in prayer. And I don't know about you, but I completely agree with that and I'm terrible at practicing it, right? So the whole goal of today is that we are invited into and answer the invitation to praying with thanksgiving and joy for the sake of love. And that, that's the whole point of today. That's the source, the source of confident joy, reclaiming joy, is prayer. Prayer is the starting point. So let's look at this. He gives thanks for the Philippians' fellowship in the gospel. I'm going to come back to that word from the first day until now. On the back of your worship paper, there's some readings, and these same readings are in our um, app. And I made a mistake on the back of your worship paper. I, I gave you the stories and acts about Philippians, but I left the one off of the 16. So you have two different ones that say Acts 6. So I need you to take a pen out, unless you're using the app. If you're using the app, you don't have to do this. It's already been fixed. But if you're not using the app, you got to change Acts 6. 6 to Acts 16, or you're going to be reading about how deacons got created, which is a great story, irrelevant to what I'm doing. Um, uh, but these are the stories of Philippi. So when Paul says, from the earliest days of the gospel, he means the beginning of, of the way that the gospel was responded to and these churches that were started in Philippi. The Philippian church started um, in the home of a woman named Lydia, very successful businesswoman. She dealt in purple cloth, which is a very luxurious and important fabric at the time, particularly in a city where imperial Rome is uh, lauded. And she was a God-fearer. She was down at the river. Paul and uh, Timothy and Silas were down at the river. They met Lydia, and Lydia listened to them, and they had conversation with her. She invited them to her home, and that's where the church started. Women are very prominent in leadership in the Philippian church. We'll meet two more of them in this letter, Rodeo and Syntyche. They, we meet them because they're not getting along, but never mind that. There's, there's a lot of women leaders in the Philippian church. From the very beginning when things took off, this, uh, these folks, the Philippians, were very committed to Paul, very close relationship. Even after he left the city, they would send him money to support himself in other cities so that there was no confusion about somebody having to pay for the gospel. They would send people with him to, uh, to minister to him whenever he was in prison. He was in prison a lot. And uh, you have to look after yourself in prison. Nobody looks after you. So the Philippians would send people to him. And in this letter, they send someone called Epaphroditus. He's going to come up later as well. Um, they, uh, he visited them several times. And in the readings that you have for this week, you're going to read different times that he was in and out of Philippi. This was his, this was his heart church, I'd say. His home church was in Antioch. His heart church was in Philippi. And you can see it in this letter. This letter is full of affection and love between them. And right in the center of this first prayer of thanksgiving and joy is verse 6. Take a look at verse 6. That's where Paul says that the one who began a good work in you, and that you is plural, it's among you, will be faithful to complete it in the day of Christ Jesus. This is the anchor of these prayers in verses 3 to 8. Everything Paul says in these verses leads into that center point and then back out from that center point. This is the anchor. And what he says is, I'm confident that it's God who began this good work in Philippi, in each of you individually and also you together, and this God will finish 
this work. Paul doesn't have to be in the middle of this work. He may never get out of prison again. It's Jesus Christ at the center of this work with God who's at work among them who's going to see it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Paul can be confident of this because he wasn't even supposed to be in Philippi. Did you know this? He had travel plans elsewhere. Any of you have travel plans changed this summer? Yeah? How welcome was that, right? So Paul had travel plans changed. He had a vision. A man from Macedonia appeared and said, please come to us. He took that as indication that the Lord was sending him to Macedonia, and that's when he went to Philippi. From the very beginning, he knows that God was involved in starting this new thing. Uh, He saw God's involvement when there was a young woman who was enslaved, who had spiritual powers because she was demon-possessed, and she was being exploited by her owners. Her spiritual powers were being exploited, and they released her. They freed her from this demon possession, and they got in a lot of trouble for it because these men no longer made their money off of this young woman. Uh, He has seen God's power and presence working in Philippi from the beginning. And his, uh, the joy and the thanksgiving that Paul expresses is not based on circumstances. And this is also very distinct to the Philippians. Paul in this letter is in prison. We don't know which imprisonment it was, if it was Ephesus, if it was Caesarea, if it was Rome. We do know that he anticipated his own death as a result of this imprisonment. We're going to see that later on in chapters one and two. He thinks it's more likely that he will be executed than that he is released, even though he wants to be released. He's preparing the Philippians for his execution. On top of that, we know from this letter that Epaphroditus, this beloved leader in the Philippian church who I mentioned, the second he showed up to support Paul, he had an unexpected illness. He nearly died, weakened him terribly. Paul is needing to send him back to Philippi, most likely with this letter. None of the hopes that there were for Epaphroditus working with Paul worked out, and this church has been deeply concerned about Epaphroditus, who they love. And then on top of that, there's conflict in the congregation, Erodia and Syntyche, as I, as I mentioned. It's a private conflict between these two very visible leaders. They're called co-workers in the gospel, technical term for people who are side by side with Paul in his work, and they're not getting along, and everyone knows it. So this private disagreement among workers has become very public among the churches in Philippi, and that's hard on a church, and it's shameful, And he's writing into that circumstance. And then on top of that, there are preachers of the gospel who don't like Paul. So they are intentionally preaching the gospel in places and ways to weaponize it against Paul while he's in prison. So he's dealing with that. So there's a little bit going on when Paul writes these letters. Let's summarize. Persecution, imprisonment, threat of death, severe illness, private conflict that has become very public, public conflict that uses the preaching of the gospel as a weapon, and any one of those is a joy kill. Any one of those should result in a dampening of joy. But Paul is intent on reclaiming the joy of the gospel and making sure the Philippians do the same. And the core of this is this prayer of thanksgiving and joy. So here is this enduring letter that begins with joy, it begins with thanksgiving and confidence, and especially it begins with love. And the reason, the place that all of this joy originates is the confidence, not in the Philippians, not in Paul, but in God, who finishes all things. This is what's so essential. I don't know the voices that go on in your head. I don't know where where you're so annoyed at yourself for how unfinished you are or so annoyed at somebody else for how unfinished they are, right? Uh, How finished or unfinished your life feels at this point, how the plans are going. All of these things destroy our joy. And Paul writes to say, hey, the place, the starting place to reclaim joy, confident joy, is not in your capacity to see this through, to finish, to get things where you want them to be. It's in God's capacity to finish the good work that he's begun for you. I want to show you a slide. This is a picture of a needlepoint. Go ahead and Sam, hit the next slide for me, would you? I slipped these in and didn't tell Sam I was going to do this. So I like to do needlepoints. This is a needlepoint kit that I picked up at some time when I was living in Paris, and I thought it was delightful. And it has what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, like a dozen characters from Winnie the Pooh. And my niece, 
Molly, the oldest niece in the family, the daughter of my late brother, uh, a few years ago, she was pregnant with the very first great, great grandbaby, great grandniece in the family. And so I sent her a picture of this. I said, hey, do you want me to make this for you for the nursery? She goes, yeah, that would be great, right? Well, let me show you a picture of Nora now so you now know how old Nora is, okay? So there's Nora. She's three and a bit. And I have finished basically <laughs> one... I, I, go ahead and go back to the last slide, Sam, so we can compare this. I have finished uh, one Winnie the Pooh character for each year of her life. She is three and a half. I have removed more of this needlepoint than I've finished because I make so many mistakes on this one. I, I don't even spell her name. N-O-R, not even gotten to the A yet. Um, at this rate, she's going to be in middle school before this thing gets finished, right? I'm getting one done. This is unfinished. This is unfinished. That is finished. That's where it's supposed to go. And we can go ahead and skip past Nora again now. Thankfully, Nora doesn't know she's supposed to be getting this. I'm just going to leave this here for a minute so you can continue to see this example of something unfinished. And we can, yeah, and we can just go to the, to the sermon slides again, Sam. Here's the deal. Is the confidence of the, this is where the Philippians are living. This is probably where you're living. If you're human, this is where you're living. Even if you feel very finished, if you look around at our world, this is where we're living. We can compare this to what finished looks like in the kingdom of God, to what God has promised that finished looks like. Finished looks like relationships that are reconciled. Finished looks like justice, where there is injustice, where the poor are exalted and the oppressors are brought low. Finished looks like peace rather than violence. Finished looks like restoration and resurrection. Finished looks like bodies that are not breaking down and being caught with unexpected illnesses. Finished, finished is what is promised in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to be human is to live in the unfinished. To be human is to live in between the promises and the pictures of the gospel and the kingdom of God and the process right now until we get there at the end. And Paul's confidence, his joy, is not in how very nifty three and a half of these figures look, right? Although I do have to say I took a whole lot of joy when I finally finished Eeyore. His confidence is in the finished, in where this is going, in the fact that because of the death resurrection of Jesus Christ and his exaltation to the right hand of God, there will be a day when Jesus returns and he finishes it. The lion will lie down with the lamb. There will no longer be the birth of a child who only lives for days. The weak will be made strong. The lame will leap. The nations will gather at the throne of God and hear the word of the Lord go forth. And every knee on earth and above the earth and under the earth shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is finished. And that is the source of our joy. We live seeking joy in the messy middle from a God who promises salvation. We live with joy as a gift of the Holy Spirit, not as a result of our circumstances. It's a fruit of the Spirit. We live in faith in the finished. But if we're going to live there, it's not enough for our heads to say, I'm going to choose joy, which we need to do. It's not enough even for just our prayers to choose thanksgiving and joy, which we need to do. We also need Philippians 9 through 11. We need the love of God in Jesus Christ. We need to know that love that surpasses understanding. We need to grow in that love that surpasses understanding. Because we don't have the heart. We don't have the heart to rejoice in the finished without the love of God that puts us back together that we can trust to put all things back together. When Paul talks about your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, that word koinonia is fellowship. It doesn't mean you intellectually agree with the gospel. It means you're participating in the gospel. To participate in the gospel is to so grow in the height and depth and breadth and width of the knowledge and instruction of the love of God that we can live into the finished even when all circumstances say the finished is impossible. It's to let that love transform us and take us forward. It's to sit in prayer to receive that love and to return that love 
is to read scriptures to receive that love and to return that love. Love received and returned and lived out, that is the defense and the confirmation of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is my prayer, Paul says, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. All those places in you that are unfinished, they need to be loved, not shamed, not broken down, not defeating you. They need to be loved by God and Jesus Christ who forgives and restores all these things that are unfinished in the people in your lives that are hurting you and annoying you and about you that are hurting and annoying them. They need to be loved. They need to be loved to be restored. And that love has to come from God and Jesus Christ because human love can't do it. All these things in the world, the violence and the destruction and the injustice that hurts the need and the lack and destroys the exhaustion of work and the frustration. They need love. They need love to make it right. Love that abounds more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, intimate knowledge of God's love and wisdom that comes from that. Paul assumes that love has to be learned. You don't pick up love naturally. It's not native. Romantic love will not do it for you. Family love will not do it for you. Friendship love will not do it for you. There's a love that needs to be learned, and there's a pattern to this love. The pattern to this love, just like I have a pattern for my unfinished needlepoint, the pattern for this love is God revealed in Jesus Christ. And the letter to the Philippians gives us the pattern of this love, that Jesus Christ, who being in the very form of nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself took on the form and nature of a slave and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. This is the pattern of that love. This needs to be learned. This takes some time. So I have some invitations for you, okay? To reclaim joy this week, the first thing I want to invite you into is that prayer, to pray with thanksgiving and joy. Now, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I am very good at teaching prayer. I think I am. I'm very good at preaching Prayer, I think I am. I am terrible at practicing prayer. I know I am. Uh, I have a squirrel in my brain. And the second I try to pray with thanksgiving, the second I try to pray with joy, it just starts spinning on everything I need and everything I want and everything that's not right. And so to interrupt that with thanksgiving and joy in the one who has begun a good work and will see it to completion is essential. It's essential. Interrupting it, by focusing those prayers on others with thanksgiving and joy. The very people that we think we need to pray for because relationships are hard with thanksgiving and with joy because God can finish this. So I wanna invite you this week to thanksgiving and joy to pray. Set us some time to pray. If you want any help in finding an app that can help with that, come and talk to myself, talk to Pastor Chris, talk to Stacy. we'll set you up with an app. But let's get you praying. Okay, here's the second thing. There are some Philippian, uh, there's some scripture journals of the letter to the Philippians. They're out next to the uh, Welcome Center. I hope you'll take one. Because for our love, to add, for that lo uh, prayer to be answered, that our love abounds more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That doesn't happen just from sitting in worship. I want to challenge you to be in worship every single time you're in town this fall. Because we need to sit with this letter. But it's not enough to just come to worship. We've got to sit with the words. You've got to pull the letter out of the underwear drawer, open up your scripture journal, and then the passages that we're doing the next Sunday, they're, in, they're on the app, they're in the bulletin. Just make notes for yourself. Sit with it. Let God talk to you. Talk back to God. There's no right or wrong way to journal. Some people write down their questions. Some people write their prayers. Some people just, you know, reflect. I don't know. Some people draw. Some people draw. But journal. Take one of those journals. If you want to add five bucks, to the offering, great. If you don't, no worries. We got this covered. Take a journal. If we run out of journals, let us know. We'll get some more this week. But please, take a journal. Pray, take a journal, and then would you please get into a place where you can make some friends here, where you can be loved. Uh, I don't know if you feel like this church is your finished place or not. I can tell you right now, we are not finished, right? We, it's hard to figure out how to put people in connect groups. It's hard to figure out how to match people up 
with their place so they can participate in the gospel. But we're, we're unfinished and we're stumbling and we're working on our best and let's do it together. So if you are someone who is not in a, a friendship relationship yet, a week from Saturday, if you're a guy, you're invited to the, Sunday, the Saturday morning coffee. These are very casual. It's donuts. It's coffee. It's to get to know some other men in the church. I believe it's a week from the Saturday, isn't it? Did anybody look on the back of your bulletin? Somebody look and correct me if I'm wrong. Kim will correct me if I'm wrong. Is it this coming Saturday? What's it? So it's a week from next Saturday. You have so much time. You can pull out your phones and put that in your phones. I really do commend that. Women, we're having one the first Saturday in uh, whatever the next month is from now, October. The, uh, but here's the point. You need to have friends. Paul was friends with these people. Paul loved these people, and they loved him. We want to be friends with you. We want to be friends with each other. It's not finished, but that's what we want. So there's the coffee mornings, there's connect groups, there's other ways to make friendships. You can come serve together. Make a friend here. Make it your goal in the fall to make a new friend. And I'm talking to all you people who've been here a while. If you've been here a while, meet someone you don't know, make a friend. Go to coffee. Take a walk. Take them a meal. Invite them to your connect group. Let's make some friends. These are the places of our confident restoration of joy. And most of all, We need to receive and grow in the love of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read you one last thing. There's a little booklet that's also out at the Welcome Center. It's by this guy named Dane Ortland. It's called God's Greater Love. And if you're someone who you've been used to talking about or thinking about faith in terms of the stuff you believe, but the whole idea of intimacy with God, intimacy with God's love, that feels weird. And trust me, it should feel weird because that's a big deal. And you want to grow in that way. Would you take one of these, please? And here's what he writes. The Bible says not simply that God loves, but also that God is love. Love for the God of the Bible is not one activity among others. Love defines who God is most deeply. A love so great and so free that it could not be contained within the uproarious joy of Father, Son, and Spirit, but spilled out to create and embrace finite and fallen humans into it. Divine love is inherently spreading, engulfing, embracing, overflowing. He wants you to know a love that is yours, even when you feel undeserving or numb. The love of God is not something to see once and believe and then move beyond to other truths or strategies for growing in Christ. The love of God is what we feed on our whole lives long, wading ever more deeply into this endless ocean. And that feeding, that wading, is itself what fosters growth. And I would add, what fosters confident joy. Let's pray.